So you're right at the center of something that has changed the United States, is in the process of changing a lot of the world, this vaccine. Give us a sense, when this emergency first happened, when was it, January, February of last year, um, did you know you could do it? Because there were a lot of experts that said it could not be done. We could not have an effective, safe vaccine in that short a period of time. Oh, thank you for having me here. I wouldn't say I knew I can do it, but what I knew is that I have to do it. <laughs> because I would uh, realize that uh, the consequences, if uh, we fail, will be dramatic. And uh, although I have high respect for everyone who tried, I knew that uh, very few will have the dedication that we are having. So in a sense, I was feeling that if it is not us, then I'm afraid no one else will find the solution. And that was not an option. So I treat it like if uh, that's it. We do it and we have to do it. So, so as I understand, you had repositioned the company some when you took over as CEO more toward basic science and some of the high-end drugs, high-risk, high-reward drugs. So you may have been better positioned for that. But as you looked at the problem, what alternatives did you have? What tools did you have in your toolkit saying, I have to have a vaccine, how do we go about doing it? Because you ended up with mRNA, but that was not the only alternative. Yes. First of all, let me say that I did... Uh, reposition the, the, the company when I took over in, in, in 2019, but only because of the work of my predecessor. It's not because we have a new ter sheriff in town. Uh, it, uh, he worked very hard uh, to turn around the R&D. So when I took over, I found an R&D machine that I could uh, believe. And this is why I took all the risk to say that let's find better homes for other businesses and let's focus on the science. Another thing that we did when we said let's focus on science, I knew that in biological science, equal importance with biology has now digital. And uh, that was the time that we brought for the first time a chief digital officer at Pfizer. And we dramatically increased the investments in R&D and in digital. The digital infrastructure that we built in 19 and in the first half of 20 was what helped us dramatically to make this vaccine uh, work. Uh, a lot of these things would not be possible unless we have this seamless uh, uh, machine that uh, had digitized our clinical trials. So you ended up with mRNA as the platform. Uh, as I say, not the only alternative, but also not one that had been used before, as I understand it, for vaccines. Was this the first time that had been used as a platform for vaccine? Yes, it was the first time that it gave a successful vaccine. Hmm. So when um, time, uh, when I realized that we need to go not only on therapeutics, because the first weeks I was trying to, to bring therapeutics to the world, but when I realized that we need also to go for a vaccine, I asked our scientists to suggest to me what would be the best path uh, forward. And uh, unlike um, other companies that uh, they, they didn't have an option, for example, Moderna, they were so good in mRNA, right? Mm -hmm. For them, the option is, shall we go for a vaccine or not? Ourselves, we were good in very uh, many technologies. So we, we had high expertise with adenovirus, which is the AstraZeneca or the j, &J with proteins, which is the Novavax. Uh, and uh, they came and suggested to me mRNA. And it was very counterintuitive, the decision. I told them, are you sure? <laughs> if you do that, this is not going to be only the first COVID vaccine. That will be the first vaccine ever. Mm. And uh, they felt strongly about it. And uh, I had to place my trust on them, and I did. And uh, that was pivotal. You also, I think, placed your trust in part with BioNTech. You had already a joint venture working not for this sort of vaccine, but for a flu vaccine. Tell us about that relationship. No, I asked also actually the, the same question. I told them that was the first question. The first question was, are you sure? Because that will be the first vaccine. And the second was, we need to do it fast. If we have to go mRNA, we'll do it with a partner. Are you sure? And uh, they gave me exactly the answer that uh, I knew, that uh, we have worked with them for two years already in uh, an mRNA flu a vaccine. And uh, we believe they are wonderful for that. Um, I didn't have myself personal contacts with the biotech management, particularly with uh, Uger who is uh, the CEO and founder of the company. So I, I gave him a call immediately. And we hit it off from the first uh, call. Uh, and we hit it off uh, that well that um, when uh, time cam came to, to do the deal, I told him, Ugur, you know, it's going to be very challenging to put that in a contract before a few months. Uh, what are we doing? And he said, I'm fine to do it without contract if you are fine with that. And then I said, your word is uh, good enough for me. And then we started working. After two or three weeks, we signed a letter of intent. 
And many people who do not know that our commercial agreement, the agreement that says how we are splitting, the, was signed in January of 2021. <laughs> <laughs> after everything was done and we had already sales. Because simply we didn't have time to do that, and the trust between the two of us was uh, so deep. So as a recovering lawyer, where were your lawyers? Normally we'd say you cannot do that on a handshake. This yeah. is a huge venture, a huge gamble, as it were, and you're doing it on a handshake. That's not done in business, typically. That's not done in business, typically. But that was very a typical situation. This was not the... Uh, uh, it was not the future of the company. It was the future of the world. And we couldn't afford, uh, none of us, to, to lose time first to settle all the, the legal language before we start uh, doing the work. And the lawyers understood that. Tell us about the timetable, because you said you did to do it quickly. Uh, as I recall, I think President Trump said we'll do it in a year or so. Uh, what did you do in terms of setting an internal timetable for getting this done? Yeah, it was, um, if, if we were trying to set a timetable based on what is the precedent, I mean, we would have saved, uh, sent, uh, we would have set a timetable for eight years because the president is 10, so <laughs> let's do it faster, it's eight. It wouldn't work. The way that I set the timeline was we had the first wave, and then we were thinking that now it's going down because summer was coming, but I knew from the Spanish flu uh, the, uh, a century ago that the second wave came and it was way more lethal than the first one. So I told my team that what we should prepare for it is something that will help us during the second wave, and that will come in late fall. So from my perspective, you need to bring a vaccine by end of October. So it wasn't so much the science as we need to do it, because otherwise we're going to have huge problems with that second wave come and fall. That's, look, when you set a goal to someone uh, that it is uh, difficult, but within the parameters, let's say instead of 10 years, do it at eight, or in manufacturing. Instead of 200 million doses, I want you to manufacture 300 million doses. They always think within the box. They will always think to try to find incremental improvements to what we do. But if you tell them, not eight years, eight months, <laughs> if you tell them not 300 million, 3 billion doses, they need to think completely different. And this is what they did. They start re-engineering everything, and they came with uh, genius solutions. People, they don't know what they can and what cannot do. Well, that's an extraordinary story. So give us a, a sense of what we have right now. Uh, first of all, one of the things everybody wants to know about is boosters. I mean, I got my Pfizer shot, the second one, in February. Uh, do we have a sense? Do you have any data that would tell you when I'm going to need a booster? We are collecting a lot of data, but we are having some pivotal studies that are running, so we need to wait to see what the studies will tell us. But basically, on holistically, as I see the sets of data that are available so far, I do believe that the studies will indicate that between 8 and 12 months, a booster will be needed. And, uh, of course, we are working on the data. We will submit to regulators like FDA in the U.S. And once and if approved, then CDC, which is the health authorities, will uh, decide when they will recommend or not a booster. So speaking of CDC, let's talk about uh, possible side effects, mm -hmm. because this is under emergency youth authorization. It's mm -hmm. not final authorization yet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're constantly monitoring possible side effects. As I understand, the CDC is look, taking a look at heart inflammation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any in indication about whether we have a side effect problem with mm -hmm. heart inflammation? We are looking at all reports that are coming, and there are several reports that are coming. And um, what we try to do in situations like that, it is to see if the an incident, for example, you spoke about some heart problems, is it higher in the vaccination group than what is expected to be in a group like that? Because when you have hundreds of millions of people vaccinated, for example, you will have car accidents, right? So is it uh, higher? Then the vaccine is responsible for the car accidents because maybe you make you dizzy. If it is not, then it is just uh, um, normal life. So this is what we are trying to do. From the data that we have seen so far, we haven't seen a signal. But uh, this doesn't mean that we should not be monitoring uh, very deeply into the situation because more data are coming and accumulated. So we do that ourselves with our databases, and I'm sure authorities all over the world are doing it as well. Uh, as I say, you're under emergency youth authorization. I think that you have applied for full authorization mm -hmm. here. What's the time on that? And I ask that in part because we hear from some employers we don't want to require people to be vaccinated until we're, we have the full authorization. Yes. We applied already and we got a PEDUFA date, eight months. What does this mean, PEDUFA date? FDA told us that they have eight months at their disposal to approve or not uh, the full authorization. And I believe they will do it uh, earlier, but it is up to them 
to see when that will happen. So it could be maybe by the end of the year or beginning of next year. So most of us in the world got to see you just recently over in Cornwall, uh, where yes. you appeared with President Biden when he had a news conference announcing the purchase of 500 million doses from Pfizer. Tell us how that came about. Well, I think the uh, U.S. stepped up uh, in, in a great uh, way to, to help uh, the world. Um, we had discussions with the government, and um, we had raised, and they had uh, raised as well, that we need to do something for the world. We told them that we do produce a lot of uh, doses, and um, we will be in a position, and actually we would love to find a way so that we can distribute doses to the uh, low-income countries. And as you know, we had the tier pricing, so those doses, anyway, they are going at cost for us. But what the U.S. is doing is they are buying from us at cost, so non for profit. There is no profit for us. We provide the 500 million doses, but they donate them to the poorest of the countries. So they don't have to pay even the cost, those countries. I think that's great what the U.S. is doing. And uh, we do it now. So 200 million of this 500 will be given this year, in the next six months, and then the, the next 300 in the first six months of 2022. Uh, give us a sense of the path forward for the low- and middle-income countries, because certainly what we're seeing, for example, in India and elsewhere, is until we get everybody vaccinated in the world, none of us are fully safe, I think it's fair to say. Uh, so what is the path forward to deal with the low- and middle-income countries beyond the 500 million doses, which certainly is a good start? No, I think there are two things that needs to be in place. One, you have enough vaccine production so that enough for all, and then you need to have a price that is not an obstacle to anyone. The price was resolved already back in the way for those countries. I think everyone is giving at a non-for-profit pace. In terms of uh, in the manufacturing volumes, we have done tremendous progress, and this year expect to, to deliver 3 billion doses. So we made a pledge uh, and that we will give to middle and low-income countries only from Pfizer vaccine 2 billion doses in the next 18 months. Mm. One billion of these doses will be this year. And then the next billion will be next year. The 500 that the U.S. purchase is part of these two billion um, doses. So I think will be enough doses for all these countries. Starting from now, the, the, the balance will be way more, more uh, weighted towards low-income countries receiving doses than high-income countries. In the first half, high-income countries received more than the low-income countries. Well, let's talk about the future here. What comes next uh, for the world, for your industry, but for Pfizer in particular? Let's start with Pfizer. Uh, obviously, you've accomplished something that nobody thought you would accomplish. It has really helped save the world. I don't think that's an exaggeration, actually. Where do you go from here? I mean, this is, you're, at, you're at a pretty high point. What's next for Pfizer? I think uh, the fundamental question that comes to me after this great success, it is if we were able to do it for COVID, why not for cancer? Why not for Alzheimer's? Why not for many other diseases that uh, they require uh, treatments? That's in general for the industry. And uh, ourselves, we are focused on uh, six therapeutic areas that they are covering a broad spectrum of uh, medical needs, most of them unmet right now. So I think uh, there is uh, some lessons learned and uh, thinking out of the box and re-engineering your processes and uh, investing in R&D, invest creating a culture that can do the impossible possible and investing in digital is key for the success in bringing new breakthrough innovations to the world. So this is what I think uh, you will see from Pfizer in the next few uh, years, more breakthroughs that change patients' lives. So, so you mentioned Alzheimer's in there, and we just had an announcement about Biogen and the FDA. As I recall, I think Pfizer at one point sold uh, an operation of Alzheimer's to Biogen. And I wonder about that in terms of the FDA, because there's some controversy about it. It was thought that by, the FDA may have varied its processes. It overruled its, its uh, committee there, and some members quit. Is the FDA, you think, changing its standards so it's more willing to allow some experimental, if I can call them that drugs be used in some circumstances? I, I wouldn't make any general uh, conclusions from what was the specific actions of the, of the FDA. And for the specific action in the approval of this uh, medicine, first of all, it is their prerogative to do it. And, would, and also wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment either on them or on the medicine. Yeah, no, no. And I was just curious about the FDA because you deal with them quite regularly. Uh, at, at the same time, there's been a lot
lot of um, questioning of the pharmaceutical industry, even uh, even some criticism of pharmaceuticals, particularly on pricing, things like that. Uh, you've earned some goodwill, I should say, on the part of American people and maybe around the world. Uh, are you concerned you could go back the other way? And again, to pick on Biogen just for a moment, not that you'll comment on the specifics, $56,000 a year is a lot of money. Are you concerned that some people in your industry might raise some issues again that could get some criticism once again on Capitol Hill? Of course I'm concerned, because I know that reputation is earned in drops, but you can lose it in buckets. <laughs> and your reputation now is very high. We should not consider it given, and uh, we should earn it every day. So coming back to the issue of uh, pricing, particularly in the U.S. For, for drugs, I think there is a very big problem, but not the one that people may think. I will I try to explain. Right now, the cost of medicines, the overall cost of the healthcare system, is around 10 to 12%. So by definition, cannot be the big problem when it is only 10 to 12 percent. And the cost is not going up. It's going actually down. For example, Pfizer in the first quarter, we reported 5 percent reduction in prices. Although we had high sales, that was because we had higher volume. Our prices went down 5 percent, the net prices on Pfizer. What is the problem is that the Americans, they don't experience this minus 5 percent that I had in my net pricing because we have a system that basically force them to pay out of pocket for their medicines, like if they don't have insurance, although they do have. This is something that needs to be fixed, and needs to be fixed urgently. And if this fix will cost money, our sector, Pfizer to start with, but I know all the other CEOs, they are willing to contribute financially from our bottom lines so that uh, we can cover the cost. But those, what we don't want to do, it is to give money that will go to the black hole of the federal budget. We want everything that they contribute to go to lower the out-of-pocket cost of the patients. And that, we can find great solutions. So let's talk about that, because you have some pretty good relations right now, I suspect, with the Biden administration. You deal with those people quite regularly, from the president on down, Jeff Zients, everyone else. Have you had any conversations yet about maybe that kind of uh, reform being brought to bear? Because that could be a feather in the cap of whatever administration brings it to bear. No, I didn't have yet a discussion about that um, with the president, uh, uh, nor with, uh, with uh, Jeff Zients, who all our discussions are focused on what can we do for, for COVID. But I have made very clear uh, my position to the previous administration and to this one by speaking to everyone in, uh, in the two political parties and in the Senate and in the Congress. We are ready to do that. And uh, I think it will be a great opportunity for President Biden to pull together a bipartisan coalition that will reduce significantly the cost of medicines for the patients, which mm -hmm. is the, the, the thing that is now problematic. Uh, finally, Dr. Borla, uh, to ask you to go beyond your direct expertise, but you certainly are in a position to address it. Where are we going because of the pandemic in this sense? Will we be able to travel the way we used to? Will the cities come back with the vaccinations? Will it actually get us back to something like what was normal? Or will we really perpetually be living in a somewhat different world going forward? I believe in terms of uh, controlling COVID, I think we will be able to control it to a level that we could have if we want it our whole life back. But I think there were some lessons learned. Lessons that, for example, we can work remotely as, uh, as good as by coming to the office every day. I don't think this will go away. Uh, lessons that maybe you can do Zoom instead of travel for a business trip that will take you two days just to go and come. That I don't think we'll see coming away, not because of COVID, but because we learned that we can do it differently.